At number 10, we have Jean-Baptiste Bouclin. All right, we are going to kick off this list by flying back in time to the year 1673, before people had deodorant and bath water was kept around longer than milk. It was France and the famous theater actor Jean-Baptiste Bouclin, also known as his stage name Molière. This guy was super famous and headed out on the stage to crush another performance. He was in the play La Madame Imaginaire and decked out in one of the finest green suits you have ever seen. But remember, it was back in the 17th century before people could wash their hands regularly after they took a poop and a hangnail would turn to your arm getting cut off. Well, Jean Bouclin had a bit of a cold that day, or so he thought it was just a cold. He was actually suffering from tuberculosis. Just saying that word gives me red dead flashbacks and brutally hurts my heart. Moliere felt a tickle in his throat mid performance. That tickle grew into a cough, which led to the last coughing fit this guy would ever have. He died backstage. And now it said performing in the color green is cursed. I mean, you really shouldn't blame the color for this one. The guy had a lung disease, but you can't control people's superstition. At number nine, we have Tommy Cooper. Tommy Cooper was an extremely talented comedic magician who was destroying it all over the UK and Europe throughout the early 80s. He was featured on television several times and performed in a number of televised sketches. He was performing on live TV when this happened. <laughs> You can hear the audience and they are loving it because they think it's all part of his act. He was killing it while having a full blown heart attack. No one really knew what was going on so eventually just cut to commercial but by the time they got to Tommy he was already dead. As a comedian that is probably the second best way to go out. The first being at home with your family and everyone who loves you. But the second being on stage slaying it with your last joke. At number 8 we have Steve Irwin. I don't know if you can call what Steve Irwin did a performance, but I wanted to include him on this list because of all the lives he touched. I know he was a massive part of my childhood. He gave me the initial interest and love for animals. While shooting a documentary about marine life and ocean conservation, Steve Irwin was stung through the heart by a stingray. The venom of the stinger entered his heart and he was killed almost instantly. His death was massive, everyone talked about it for years, and he still lives on in the memes, not as a joke, but because people loved and idolized him so much. The dude will live forever as a legend. His family continues to carry on his legacy with both his children working in animal conservation and appearing on a variety of late night shows to keep the spark of Steve Irwin alive. RIP to a legend. For number 7 let's shoot to the year 1873 when a freak accident made it one actress's last performance. Matilda Pascal was a famous Romanian actress. She was known for her beauty and booming voice. She was married to a director who casted her in a play Don Juan de Marana. She was playing a beautiful angel and she was supposed to be hoisted up on ropes so she could fly over the audience. But it didn't go as planned. Instead of soaring like a majestic angel she went crashing straight into a wall and died from complications shortly after. Now what could have caused this horrible accident? Well it was one of the stage hands who screwed up the pulley system. It's so hard to find good help. At number 6 we have Lillian Litzel. It only makes sense that we have some circus performers on here. Before Cirque du Soleil a circus act could get shot out of a cannon, try to tame a tiger and get a cannibal shot into their stomach all in one night. Lillian would put her body at risk in other ways. She was part of the high flying ringing brothers and Barenum and Bailey circus. She performed as a strong woman but what really got people going Going was her acrobatic act. She took the act all over Europe every time without a hitch. Her and her partner were so confident with their act that they would often perform without a net. This would get the people going. The show is so much more exciting when death is on the line. On Friday the 13th of February 1931, Lillian would climb the ladder for the last time. She was performing her regular acrobatic act with her partner when out of nowhere the cord supporting her snapped and sent her plummeting to her death. She was rushed to the hospital and died two days later. Remember if it's Friday the 13th don't do any risky things if you can help it. Unless you're Jason Voorhees then it's like your birthday party or something. At number 5 we have Mitsuharu Musawa aka Tiger Mask. Depending on how big of a wrestling fan you are, you may or may not know this legend. He wasn't popular in the western scene but he is one of the greatest Japanese wrestlers who has ever lived. He was amazing both in ability and fame. A lot of people compare him to wrestling legends like Ric Flair or The Rock. Anyone who knew anything about Japanese wrestling knew who this man was. He blew up in the 90s and became the face of the Japanese circuit. But in 2009 a seemingly standard stunt would be the last time anyone saw this champion take to the mat. He was 
competing in a tag team match and was on the receiving end of a suplex. A technical move but nothing too dangerous and for whatever reason Mitsuharu didn't get up. The crowd started chanting his name thinking this was all part of the performance but when paramedics rushed in it was very clear that something had gone terribly wrong. Reports said that Mitsuharu was purple before he left the ring. The autopsy showed that he died from heart failure. It's possible that the impact dislodged something in his arteries sending it flying into his heart but it's really unknown. At number 4 we have Lee Morgan. Lee Morgan was a killer jazz musician throughout the 50s, 60s and 70s. He was a master of many wind instruments but he was best known for his abilities with the trumpet. He was well respected in the jazz community. Most people aren't lucky enough to make a career in music last that long. He was performing at a jazz club in New York in 1972 when his wife Helen Morgan walked up to the stage and shot him in cold blood. They had an argument between sets and apparently that was enough to set her off. It wasn't really the gunshot that killed him. Lee was alive for a while afterwards. He was waiting for the ambulance to arrive to save his life but it was a snowy day in New York and by the time the paramedics arrived he had already died from blood loss. At number 3 we have Vic Morrow. When you have to do your own stunts you're really putting your life at risk. Vic Morrow was about to shoot a car chase scene back in 1982. It was going to be a pretty epic shot. There was a helicopter chasing down a car with him and his two co-stars Mi Kan Din Lee who was only 7 years old and Ri Shen Yi Chan who was only 6 years old. Everyone was prepped, cameras were ready and the chopper was floating right above them. In the moments everyone was waiting for the director to yell action, something malfunctioned. One of the explosive special effects went off without warning damaging the helicopter and causing it to crash down into the car killing the three of them instantly. At number 2 we have John Eric Hexum. I don't know a lot about guns but I do know that blank rounds are still powerful enough to injure people. I saw Tom Cruise say it in an interview once that's the only reason I know. Well there was not a proper gun safety course given to John Hexum when he was on the TV set for the show The Cover Up. He was about to shoot a scene which required him to fire a gun fully loaded with blanks but like most things in the entertainment industry everything got delayed. Hexum was now sitting around on set holding a handgun that was fully loaded. Mind you it was all blanks but as I said before blanks at the right distance are still dangerous. Hexum decided that he would play the classic game Russian Roulette on himself. He took every one of the bullets out of the chamber except for one, did the classic spin then pressed the gun against his temple and pulled the trigger. After a few shots the gun fired. Even though it was just a blank round it sent chunks of his skull flying into his brain and that left him dead on the set. More of the story is don't play with guns they are not toys. And for the number one spot we have Owen Hart. Wrestling is rehearsed but that doesn't mean that professional wrestlers aren't putting their bodies on the line every time they get out there. Injuries in wrestling are as common as street fights after a UFC match. Owen Hart had a superhero alter ego named the Blue Blazer. He was a high flying eccentric character and for one match the WWE thought they would show the world how much of a superhero the Blue Blazer was. The plan was to have him descend from the rafters like he was flying. But absolutely nothing went as planned. The pulley system that was supposed to lower Hart down malfunctioned and he fell 76 feet, bounced off the ropes and slammed into the ring. The crowd thought this all might have been part of the performance. But paramedics quickly rushed in. Before the night was over one of the commentators informed the crowd that Owen Hart had died. From the fall he had serious internal bleeding and doctors were unable to save him. Just at number 10 we have Arnold Buck. You can plan all you want but sometimes things are going to try to kill you. Arnold Buck was a magician back in the 1800s. He was very talented and mystified crowds for years. One of his most famous tricks was the bullet catch. He would ask an audience member to come on stage. He would give them a bullet to load into a gun and then he would tell the person to shoot him. A pretty big ask for someone who just came to watch a show. They're like dude I just came here to get surprised a couple times not to receive life long trauma. But the bullet was a blank and Buck would already have a bullet in his hand ready to surprise the crowd. But during a performance in 1840 the audience member he had come on stage had it out for him and loaded a nail into the chamber of the gun with the blank. When he fired the gun the blank propelled the nail out of it and it went right into Buck's heart and killed him instantly. After that the guy said see I told you magic isn't real Mark you owe me 20 bucks. I just added that last part on the end. At number 9 we have Frederick Frederick. Who cares about celebrities who have one name? This guy has two of the same names. That's a bold move. Old Freddie Squared was one of the better opera singers of his generation. He was a big guy and could hit those heavy baritone notes like a champ but being a big old opera singer can come at a cost. And in 1888 he was performing in Melbourne, Australia at the Princess Theatre. He was knocking out Park and just finished his big number during the famous opera Faust. 
After he was finished, he was sneaking out of the scene through a back door and he felt something strange in his chest. After a few minutes, he had fallen dead from a heart attack. I guess you could say that the fat lady had sang. At number eight, we have Dimebag Daryl Abbott. The band Damage Plan was created by former Pantera member Daryl Abbott and they had talent to make it to a high level of success and just might have if it wasn't for what happened in December of 2004. I know with a name like Dimebag, you're going to think this is something to do with an overdose story, but I'm going to kibosh that right now and say this is nothing to do with drugs. Damage Plan was performing at a small club in Columbus, Ohio. They had just taken the stage when a man opened fire. Abbott and three people were killed along with the lone gunman. The police arrived quickly and shot and killed the assailant. His name was Nathan Gale and he had recently been released from the military due to mental illness. It's a shame that he wasn't able to get the proper help that he needed before this happened. At number 7 we have Brian Ong. You might not know wrestler Brian Ong, but if you're a wrestling fan you definitely know the great Kali. The two of them were training together, working on some pretty standard moves for a promotional match. Kali was performing a flapjack on Brian Ong. A flapjack is this. In this fight here, AT Alien. Oh! Whoa, my God. It looks pretty intense, but with two professionals, it should go very smoothly. However, Brian mismanaged the move. He grabbed on Kali's shirt while he was in the air, which caused him to land directly on his head. The injuries were severe, and he died in hospital a few days later. After an investigation, it was discovered that Brian had already been concussed, and the All Pro Wrestling League that they were working for knew about this, but still allowed him to work. This led to a major lawsuit that capped out at around $15 million. At number six, we have Carmen Miranda. There was a time when Carmen Miranda was one of the most most famous performers in the world. She was known for incredible singing and dancing skills, her drop dead gorgeous looks and her signature fruit hat. If you have never seen a performance of hers, you should probably still recognize all the things she has been referenced in, which is still going on to this day. In 1955, she was performing on the Jimmy Durant show and out of nowhere she fell to the ground. Everyone was shocked, but she returned to her feet and finished the performance. Because the show must go on. She thought that she might have just been lightheaded and didn't really think much of it. Or maybe she was just trying to ignore the real danger she was in. The next morning she was found dead from a heart attack. She was only 46 years old which is very young for someone to die from a heart attack and especially for a woman who was in as good a shape as she was. So some people speculate that drugs might have been involved. At number 5 we have Barbara Weldons. In 2017 Barbara Weldons was starting to pick up steam on the French music scene. She was going out on tours and getting accepted into festivals. It seems like things were starting to really work out for her. She was on tour performing at a church when she just dropped to the ground out of nowhere. She was quickly rushed to the hospital, but before she got there, she was dead. At first, it was a mystery. Some people suspected that she had a heart attack, but she was only 35 years old at the time. She was way too young to have something like that happen to her, but something that Weldon did frequently was perform barefoot. I mean, everyone has their brand. I personally wouldn't go on stage without shoes, but that's because I don't have toes. I actually have 10 little faces that all have different opinions on the movie Save the Last Dance. After an autopsy, it was discovered that Weldon had actually been electrocuted. Her foot touched a mouth functioning piece of equipment which sent electricity coursing through her body. At number 4 we have Sigmund Neuberger. In the late 19th and early 20th century, vaudeville was all the rage. It was a combination of performance styles that would sometimes combine singing, dancing, music, comedy, magic and really whatever someone could dream up. Sigmund Neuberger was a huge vaudeville star who went by the name The Great Lafayette. He was mainly known for his magic. One of his most famous tricks was the lion bride, where a woman would walk into a cage with a ferocious lion. Then the big reveal would happen, and everyone would see that it was just the great Lafayette in a lion's costume. Everyone would go crazy, and Newberger would make loads of money. But on one occasion, everything seemed like it was going as planned, but one of the stagehands knocked over a lantern. Back then, everything was made out of wood, so the whole place caught on fire. Newberger, 10 stagehands, and the lion that he would tour with were all killed in the flames. At number three, we have Theodore Ronald Bailey. It's not just Bailey that I want to put at number three on this list, but the seven other musicians who died with him. Bailey and all the other boys who went down with him were the musicians who were playing on the Titanic. That must have been such a bummer. You finally score a sweet cruise ship gig and then you die. Before they die, they're probably all like, if we nail this gig, we can work cruise ships forever and have a stable life. And then next thing you know, you're all drowning and dying from hypothermia. There's a legend that goes along with their deaths as well. It's said that in all the chaos of the sinking ship, they didn't stop playing music 
music, which is brave and kind of crazy. They were like, hey, you know what everyone needs to help this stressful situation? A little jazz. And actually, maybe it did help. It always calms me down. At number two, we have Goodbye to Gravity. I wouldn't expect you to be familiar with Romanian metal band Goodbye to Gravity. That's a pretty obscure area of music, but you might have heard about October 30th, 2015, when their pyrotechnics lit the venue they were playing in on fire. It was known as the Collective Nightclub Fire, and it was absolutely devastating. Fireworks from their performance caught the roofs on fire and flames started raining down on the people watching the show. In total, 62 people were killed in the flames, including four members of the band. It is known as one of the most tragic moments in music history, and is probably making everyone rethink pyrotechnics for their shows. And for our number one spot, we have The Crow. This is one of the most famous cases of people dying on set, because it is much more current than the other ones on this list, but also because of the strange circumstances. Brandon Lee was playing the lead role in the movie The Crow. During the shooting, there was a scene where Brandon was supposed to be shot by a prop gun, but someone had replaced it with an actual gun. Brandon was shot and killed. What makes the story so creepy was that the plot of The Crow is about Brandon's character being killed, then gets revived by a crow with some sort of supernatural powers, and then takes revenge on the people who killed him. Obviously just a coincidence, but still very eerie. At number 10, we have Sam Patch. Let's kick off this list with a daredevil. Guys like this used to be all the rage. They were the original stuntmen and they would put their bodies on the line so we could get a few moments of entertainment. That's the good stuff we like to pay for. Watching someone strip years off their life to make us get a slight dopamine release. This is how Jackass got popular. I'm surprised it took us three videos to get one of these daredevils on the list. Well, Sam Patch was trying to do the impossible by jumping off Niagara Falls and surviving. The jump was set for November of 1829, which seems like one of the worst months you should be jumping into a giant body of water. If you're going to jump off a giant waterfall, I would expect you to do it in the summer. Now, it wasn't that crazy because Sam had just completed the jump a week before this newly scheduled jump, but it made so little money that he wanted to do it again. This time, he put a 25 foot platform at the end of the falls so it would be an even higher jump. Well, those last few feet seemed to be all he needed to push him over the edge because he splashed down into the bottom of the water and he was gone. And I mean really gone. They didn't even find him until the spring the following year. He was all frozen and stuff. Also, if you want to make this one even more cursed, the second jump took place on Friday the 13th. Yeah, maybe you should have waited until the Saturday. I don't know. At number nine, we have Kenneth Hawks. Kenneth Hawks was a budding director throughout the 1920s and he might be a name that some of us would have remembered to this day if it wasn't for this accident. He was shooting the movie Such Are Dangerous Men, a strangely fitting title for what is about to happen. They were shooting a scene which required aerial shots with two planes shooting at the same time. While in the air, the sun broke through the clouds and created terrible glare. This made for the worst visibility. You think clear skies would be perfect flying out, but on this day, it caused the two planes to crash into each other. Kenneth and nine more people died in the crash. At number eight, we have Leonard Warren. Sometimes life is poetic and it seems like God was working on the last line of a poem for Leonard Warren. Either that or a very ironic joke. Leonard Warren was a world famous opera singer. This guy could really send it home. And while on the stage at the New York Metropolitan Opera, his performance started to have a few hitches. He started to cough and it seems like he was having trouble breathing. The whole audience was beginning to feel uneasy. It seemed like Warren was in extreme pain. Then he just dropped down to the floor and before he could make it to the hospital, he was already dead from a heart attack. The part of this whole obituary that makes this so poetic is that the song he was singing at the time of his death was titled Morir Tremaracosa, which translates to to die, a momentous thing. At number seven, we have Alberto Torres. Back in the 1960s, Alberto Torres was a rising star in the wrestling scene and he was in a tag team match when one of his opponents performed a heart punch on him. He dropped on the mat immediately and would not get up. At first, it was thought that it was the heart punch that killed him, which I didn't even know was a legal move. That seems ruthless. Who goes around punching people in the heart? That seems like the rudest thing to ever do to a person. Have you seen a Kung Fu movie? Everyone's out there punching people in the hearts to kill them. That's like that's like the number one killer move. But after closer inspection, it seemed that Torres had a ruptured pancreas. So if you were planning on punching someone in the heart, don't worry about it. You can get away with it. Everything will be fine in the end. There should be a disclaimer that pops up right now that says, warning, don't listen to anything Che Dorena says. He knows nothing about punching or hearts. At number six, we have Johnny Ace. If you have a name as cool as Johnny Ace, you know you're not gonna die from natural causes. You're gonna be too busy doing reckless things, just as this Johnny Ace was. He was a jazz musician in the early 
1950s and known for being a little bit cocky. During a set, he was backstage playing with a revolver. He was trying to do some gun tricks to show off to the other members of the band. He was convinced that the gun wasn't loaded, but here's the thing, you should always check if a gun is loaded before you pick it up. He put the gun to his head and pulled the trigger to show that it wasn't loaded, and it was. Here's a quick PSA, gun safety is very important. At number 5 we have Red Fox. One of the greatest comedians to ever grace the earth, Red Fox will forever stand in the comedy hall of fame. He paved the way for so many young black actors and comedians and will not soon be forgotten. He was the star of the show Sanford and Son and something he would like to do while on set was prank people. One of his favorite pranks was to pretend he was having a heart attack. He would grab his chest and then fall onto the ground. Everyone would freak out and then he would get a good laugh out of the whole thing. Classic stuff. Remember this was back in like the 60s and 70s before people had done that joke to death so it was still very funny. Now one time Red went to pull off his famous prank but this time it wasn't a prank. He was on set of Sanford and Son, suffered a massive heart attack and that would be the last time he ever made anyone laugh. Good to go out with a bang though, not bad. At number 4 we have Paul Montz. There isn't too many jobs out there more dangerous than a stunt pilot but Paul Montz was able to avoid certain death. Well for most of his career or he wouldn't be on this list. He was hired to do some stunt flying for the movie Flight of the Phoenix. The movie was being shot in the Arizona desert and Paul's scene required him to swoop down low close to the desert sand in a very exciting stunt. Well he swooped down way too low and one of his wings caught something, snapped snapped off and sent the plane spinning. He tried to stop the plane from crashing but went right into the sand and died on impact. It was a little bit of a mystery why such a skilled flyer would make that kind of mistake. The kind of mistake that would cost him his life. Later reports were released that Mounts had been drinking before he flew. That's something you really shouldn't do. Like drinking and driving is bad, drinking and flying, that's like a whole other level of crazy. At number 3 we have Renato Di Paolo. This one goes back to the year 2000. It was on Easter and everything went wrong. It was a live performance about the life of Jesus Christ. Renato Renato was playing the role of Judas, probably not his dream role but someone's got to do it. During the hanging scene there was a malfunction on the noose and Renato ended up actually getting hung which is probably the biggest sign that the devil is real. Or God? God would kill Judas? I don't know. Maybe? God is real? Dev I mean if one's real who cares? At number 2 we have Irma Buell. This one is a little bit obscure but it's so crazy I had to put it really high on the list. Irma Buell was a rising star in the Indonesian pop scene. She had a gimmick she would do while she performed. She would have a live cobra on stage as her sidekick. Which seems like the worst idea ever but the fans loved it and apparently the snake was pretty into it too. One show Irma got a little too into the performance, wasn't paying attention to the location of her scary friend and then stepped on the snake. Snakes don't normally react to being stepped on very well, so the snake bit her leg. Now here's where the story gets even crazier. She kept performing. She didn't stop. No, no, no. She was like, I got poisoned. Who cares? The show must go on. She stayed on stage with cobra venom coursing through her veins before she dropped to the floor. It was like 45 minutes or something before she fell down. She was pronounced dead before she reached the hospital. This is bonkers, but like, I mean, hey, she's probably one of the best performers ever. And for the number one spot, we have Katsuki Hiromi. Live performances are amazing. I would say it's one of the best way you can see many things. Comedy is way better live. Sports are way better live. Russian slapping competitions are way better live. I love Russian slapping competition videos. That's like my number one thing I love watching right now. It's so good. They just slap each other. It's great. And then they get knocked out. It's just slaps and knocks. I, never, you guys go watch it. But also if anything goes wrong, you are going to be right front and center to have your little mind scarred for the rest of your existence. In 1958, Katsuki Hiromi was performing with the world famous Taraka Sura Revu which is a kind of mix between Japanese culture and legends and the booming theatrics of Broadway. It was very extra and people wore a lot of eyeshadow, but it was cool. People were really into it. During performance, Hiromi got her outfit caught on stage. Uh oh, wardrobe malfunction. What's the worst that could happen? Her boob popped out? Well actually it was 100 times worse than that. She was torn into two pieces. Yeah, this was a horrific scene in front of everybody, but the theater insisted on no refunds. Uh -oh.